This is data visualization in R, and we're now at section 10. This is Ryan Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. In this section, we are going to talk about interactive approaches to data. And we are going to start with animation as an example. And animation is, if you think about it, a method of making the data a little bit more alive or interactive. It is not necessarily under the control of the user, but uh, this is where we're going to start. So in R, uh, it is actually extremely easy, surprisingly easy, to generate animations. And this is in section 6 of the code. Uh, we just load one library, the animation library, and we can do things like uh, create a GIF of brownie in motion. So here we see some particles that are moving back and forth frame by frame in little you know random random motion um, that's one example uh, that example won't run on your system unless you have image magic uh, but a little built-in example and a bit of a more complex example is the one that follows. In this example we are going to look at a probability distribution, in this case the Weibull distribution, and try to figure out what happens to it as we vary different parameters of the Weibull. So the first, it looks slightly long the code, all we're doing is looping through different parameter values. And so the Weibull is one of these distributions that changes shape dramatically depending on the the parameters that are input. Now if we want to have a way to see that all at once, we can plot those combinations. In this case I'm plotting a hundred combinations using a four, four loops, nested four loops, and I'm using one function called savehtml. And savehtml will string together any of the, the graphs that are put inside it and turn it into an animation. So here we have the 100 combinations plotted um, and it's playing through all those combinations. We can fast forward, we can pause, it comes with this built-in little controller, we can set the speed and it's got some uh, documentation of um, how that graph has been created here. So we've got everything we need for a self-contained HTML page. You can actually copy this code, save it, move it over to a, your own website and it will run. It's completely self-contained. Uh, so it's a very nice little feature um, and it, you can use that for anything. So if you have your own sequence of 10 different graphs that you just want to play in order, just run those 10 graphics commands inside a save HTML set of brackets and save it to a, an HTML file and you'll be done. It's super simple. Um, so you can try that out. Uh, it's, it's really, really great. Uh, you can also create GIFs or other formats, other video formats. A very convenient function. And sort of the larger point of this is we're now starting to think about uh, moving away from those static principles of uh, say tufty images on the page type of graphics to uh, an environment where we think of you know we're on the computer by default everyone should have the capability to go in and manipulate the data and see things in motion see things um, in different ways that they can understand. So there's a link on slide 52, on page 52, to a discussion of why aren't all our graphs interactive, right? This is sort of the question that uh, comes up these days. And so that's what this section is trying to explore to some extent. So we're going to talk about different ways of being interactive. Uh, and this, let me just go through the items on this slide for a second. Uh, some of the terminology. So people talk about brushing. Brushing means when we're say looking at data points in a graph we we mark certain points. We can highlight them, color them, and once we've done that uh, we can look at those same data points in other contexts 
and track them, so you sort of see how they behave. Is this group of, of points related across many different visualizations? We can also uh, do standard things like drill in, zoom, subset our data, that's interactivity. Uh, we can link data displays so that something that happens in one screen, uh, we make a selection there and it, it modifies what happens on the second screen. Um, and so all these things are things that we can use to explore our data and understand more complex, more multidimensional relationships of data than we otherwise would. Okay, so we're going to go back into the code and we're going to look at building up from sort of basic interactivity to more uh, high-level interactivity. And so we're now in section 7 of the code. Uh, the first example that I want to highlight here in 7.1 is time series data. So time series has a, a sort of a standard plot which is called the decomposition of the time series. And, and here I'm just using some built-in data on air travel and it's the number of passengers from the early post Second World War period up through the early 60s which was a steady increase in air travel except there was a seasonal component because people tend to fly during summer and the holidays not so much other times. So uh, the first panel is the actual data that's been observed and the second panel is there's you know sort of standard methods of isolating the seasonal trends. This is discussed uh, we, we, there's also a sequence of time series videos that you can look at if you want more on this. Uh, but there's a trend, and this is the trend. It's sort of a s pretty steady upward trend in air travel. There's a seasonal component, so if we, if we try to understand what the constant seasonal effect is, this is what has been estimated from the data. Uh, so a summer peak followed by a trough and some other little holiday blips of activity. And then the part that we can't explain by either the trend or the seasonality we call random. Uh, it may not be truly random, it may just be the things we don't understand yet about the data, but uh, that's this bottom panel. Now this is a linked data panel because if we look at it uh, on vertical slices we can see, okay, we want to understand why what's going on at this peak. We can follow it down and say, well, a certain amount of that is the overall trend. Uh, we can add about 60,000 travelers to, due to the seasonal peak and there's some random fluctuation there as well and we can maybe take a look at the, the particular seasons that were well below what we might expect with a, a, a trough in the random variation or well above what we, we might expect with the peak in the random variation and that would enable us to you know, get a better understanding of the data because we are linking the data panels. So although the graph is static, there is, in a sense, some interactivity here. Let's look at 7.2, our next example, which is a graph called the table plot. And this is another technique that you can use for data exploration to understand the relationships between different variables. Now, this is back to our old friend, the diamonds data and we are uh, looking at the relationship of the different variables in the diamonds data set. What a table plot does is it slices our data set into bins or groups. The default here is 100 bins. You can adjust that if you want. Uh, you can set 10 bins or 20 bins or 1,000 bins, whatever you like. Um, we're just going to leave it at, at the default and it's, it's going to sort by the first variable in the data set. So here we have the carrots and the top slice are the diamonds that have the highest carrot weight. And we can see those are over two carrots um, and then we go all the way down to the smallest diamonds which are 0.2-ish uh, carrots weight of diamonds and then we read this across. We go in horizontal slices. So for the very smallest diamonds, uh, the, those diamonds have this profile of cut rating. 
Uh, they have a very large number of the RNG very good diamonds. Uh, they have this sort of color profile, this sort of clarity profile, uh, where there's very few um, of the the really low level clarity ratings among the tiny diamonds, um, and and so on across across the way. The only thing where there's a very consistent relationship is obviously the price of the diamond is very closely related to the carat weight. Uh, so that marches smoothly upward, although you can see there's a lot more variation. Uh, the blue represents the variability. So even though the carat is very, we're sorting by carat, so obviously those are bunched together, but that can result in a wide range of prices for a given carat weight. And you could maybe pick up some patterns here. Uh, the clarity uh, tends to diminish as we get to bigger diamonds just because it's harder to find a really perfect diamond. Uh, there's some sort of seemingly cyclical bulges in the cut that we're getting these little places where the number of ideal cut diamonds drops off significantly um, and then you could look to see well what is causing that. Um, so this is a way to, and, and because we're looking at a hundred different sorted bins of data, this is actually a lot of information uh, being displayed at once. So we have moved to a place where we can potentially understand, potentially reveal some more complicated relationships with the data. But still a static image. So let's move to an actual interactive Im image. And here I want to talk about uh, the Google Viz package as one example. Um, so because we're doing this in the video format I'll take a little bit more time to explore than I would in the classroom and go back to the, the history. So uh, this visualization originally became famous uh, due to the work of Hans Rosling and if you go to YouTube and, and Google Hans and, and search for Hans Rosling um, you will find some very interesting videos. There's a longer TED talk. Uh, there's a quick version that's only um, four minutes or so that talks about how he developed this concept. And he actually originally d originated the programming. When this was first done, it was all sort of his project uh, to do this. And Google took it up. Uh, and you can actually do this within uh, Google Docs themselves. You can do a fusion chart within Google Docs. Uh, but there's also an R package that lets you link any data set uh, to any data set within R and pass it to the Google service and sort of instantly generate this kind of visualization. So the video shows you, you know, the actual Hans Rosling original version uh, and his point was about economic development. We'll see that in just a second. Um, but the Google Viz package does some really nice stuff. Um, it has methods for... Oh, did I not load this correctly? Let's try again. Much better. Um, now this does run with Flash and so you'll have to sort of enable it to run in Flash. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of uh, pushback from your computer about these things. The first example that I have in the code is a map where we have this hover capability. So I've passed the map population and rank of population for all the countries in the world. And so you can hover over the map and see the size of you know different countries, their rank, and and do a quick comparison, and it takes a fraction of a second. Um, so just to take a look at the the data itself, uh, all you need to do is make sure that your data is in a very simple standard format, and it's going to work. Um, basically, in this case, it means using the official country names um, for the world population. All we have in this data set is one column with country name, one column with population, and one column with the rank. Um, and very simple 
uh, if you think of it in spreadsheet form, and instant, thanks to the Google service, instant conversion to something that looks nice on the screen. Um, let's look at a second example, and this is the, the, the better example of a motion chart. So your motion chart, and I might have this a little bit too large for that screen, lets us plot some data and actually does very well in plotting data over time. We can press play and set the chart in motion. We can mark certain things, so if we want to highlight and track one particular variable we can do that. Um, we can change the color of the bubbles on the graph to reflect different things. Um, so the profit might change over time and therefore the color of the bubble will change. Um, this does these moving bubbles and it also does a bar chart over time. So you can have a, a bar chart that actually changes over time. And it also will do a time series line graph. So it leaves the control of what is displayed up to the user. This is a, a, actually a key point uh, to keep in mind that we're not imposing this structure on the user. We're giving them the data and letting them uh, select the variables that they want to plot, the way they want to analyze it, the, even the scales to some extent. And so uh, it's a really nice, powerful, and quick method of, of doing doing this work. If we look at the data again, um, this is a very simple format. You just have to have the names of the variables, some kind of date parameter that you're going to use, and then the rest uh, in columns. And it will take care of the rest uh, very easily with a very minimal structure of the data. So now uh, there's also built into Google Viz package the uh, a, a demonstrator version of the World Bank data that Hans Rosling made famous. So let's let's try this. It takes a bit of time for this to run and download. So let's just wait a moment. Here it comes. Um, this is the the one of the major points that Rosling was trying to make with this data was the change uh, in health and welfare across the world uh, over the last 50 or so years of development. And so his plot here is fertility rate versus life expectancy. And so this demographic transition where uh, countries have, have moved to fewer children, investing more in the welfare of the children, uh, and this whole transition to a more developed society has had enormous gains in actual life expectancy, one of our probably more, more important things that we that we care about uh, in the world. And so this graph has all the countries of the world. We can hover over them and see which ones we're talking about. Um, and the size of the bubble in this case is actually the population. So you can see those big bubbles are China and India. And you can also highlight particular um, bubbles. So let's highlight a couple of things here. And just compare US. Don't want it to get too busy, but let me highlight a few things. And so then when I press play, we're going to see the change for these different countries over time. Um, fertility rate actually doesn't decrease immediately for some of these countries, but you'll see that actually for the countries I've tracked and for most of the countries on the in the graph, uh, they're all sort of moving down to the bottom right, which is low fertility, high life expectancy, um, and we can see that this is in a way just like the Menard graph of Napoleon's march that we maintain the complexity of the data. We see, we can see any country we want. We can track all that. Uh, let me just run it one time without the, the tracking. And we see that all that complexity, 
but it still makes the overall point very strongly. I mean, there are really very few countries that don't see some kind of improvement here or some kind of really significant improvement in life expectancy. Um, and this is just one of the views of the data. We can, we can go in and we can select several other uh, variables to investigate. We can plot it differently, again, via bar charts, via line charts. Really a fascinating tool um, that you can use to investigate pretty complex phenomena. And this is really, I think, one of the, the, the better examples, especially since it only takes a few seconds to put your data in this format um, as a, a, a case where interactivity improves your understanding of the data and with computing today there's no reason not to do it. Okay, so that's Google Viz. There's some other packages out there. Uh, uh, people like this approach and they're they're developing their own packages for their own fields so you might want to try the biodiversity uh, we mentioned the rain freak uh, package earlier when we talked about maps and that's actually um, you know interactive in its own sense because you can choose which series to download and display from a live database right this is another element okay so moving on Let's talk about a few other R packages that, that you can use for interactive data. And I'm just going to make this one long video. I'm not going to take a break here. Um, we have the Play With package. This is very versatile. Uh, Play With is sort of an add-on that you can process other functions through. So I'm going to... Uh, do this. This is in line 765 approximately in section 7.4 uh, of the code. I'm not sure if I sometimes as I go through I edit the, the code a bit and the line lines move up and down a bit. So this is our older command, the cloud command uh, that produces a 3D view of the car data that we've been working with earlier. Um, but I'm going to play with it and what play with does is it takes the existing graph so if we re just ran the cloud command we get this image but we've embedded it in play with so play with is this framework that enables us to actually manipulate and work with what used to be a static graph so we can brush points remember we talked about brushing I can highlight specific things. I say, well, those these are interesting points. I want to see how they behave as I move the cube around, right? So then I can click pan and I can just pull on that cube, drag it a bit. I can see where those brushed points remain. And you can see the the angle parameters are actually being displayed up here as I drag it. Uh, not responsive in all directions as I guess a limit to what it wants to do but I can move that around I can zoom in and out I can adjust other settings I can identify points right so if I want to know well what observation is that that's number 18 row 18 in the data set um, and you can actually provide labels as well that will um, that will do a little better than that. So once I've identified the point that that stays on the graph even as I adjust the cube and move it around and this play with also functions as slightly as an editor of the data so I can um, draw things on the graph and say things like that. I can I can actually stick some annotations onto the graph. And then once I've done that, I can I can actually save the, the image in this format. So it's it has an editing function as well. Uh, we can change the style of these um, of these displays. So you may want to use it for that purpose, but 
uh, right now I'm really highlighting the ability to navigate, select, brush, identify uh, within a, a data set and the way that it converts a, what used to be a static R function into something interactive. And that'll work not just for 3D but for two-dimensional objects. This is just a standard scatter plot but we can use it to identify points, right? If we say, well, this one looks awfully low, or the, you know, I, and that's observation 15, that's observation 16, then I can go back into the data and figure out what's going on with those. And once again, annotate them. Uh, I drew my arrow in the wrong direction. I should have drawn it in this direction. And do an annotation. and insert it, right? So, uh, again, the function is play with. It's very versatile. Um, there are other packages like that. Uh, some of them, I'm, I've got them on the slide uh, because I've been running this workshop for a while. I'm leaving them in the slide for your information, but I'm not going to run them. Uh, RGGOBI, this used to be a, a powerful 3D tool, and I have found trying to put it on different systems recently that it's no longer being updated. Um, certain environments, um, you're going you're to have trouble getting all the requirements because it's getting a bit out of date. And uh, it, it may or may not work on your system. You may want to experiment it with it. There is a website that, it, that discusses GGOBI. Uh, but I'm not going to show any any of it here. Uh, Latticeist is somewhat similar in that it's no longer being um, updated to the same degree. But I am going to focus on uh, 7.6. This is the Rattle package, and the Rattle package is a complete interactive environment. This is again something a bit different. It's not just a graphical technique. It is an environment designed to do data mining in R. So this is a little bit of a digression in a sense because the, the function of Rattle is much larger than just graphics. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it here. The, the Rattle package, if you just launch it, you enter this interactive environment and the idea of each of these tabs is that you step through a process of opening up your data, exploring your data, doing some modeling with your data, and then you know, completing the, the process. So we can select, uh, let's say, in our data set. We should have some things in our uh, workspace already, such as the diamonds data. Let's just grab that. Um, so. This is, this is not a Rattle tutorial. Uh, that would be something you might want to seek out if this interests you. But just real quick, uh, I've selected our data set, selected the, the diamonds data from the list, and click Execute. The one thing you want to do here is hit Execute every time you want to run a particular decision. So it's loaded the data in, and then I can start to explore it by uh, just running some summary statistics or correlations or different things on the the data and when I hit execute it's going to run those commands and present the output to me in the rattle environment and I can save the log of all this work I can export and create reports and when I actually go into different parts I'll be able to actually um, run some of those categorical categorization algorithms that we saw earlier. So this is um, and several of those those tools uh, like this uses GGOBI in in its interactive data exploration. Um, several of these segments will allow you to do some graphical work uh, but 
I include, I'm, I'm not going to go further with Rattle. It's, it is a, a sort of a large separate topic. Uh, but just so that you're aware that this is an interactive data exploration environment that is designed for data mining. And so that may be of interest to many of you. All right. At this point, I am going to, I think, break off at this slide so that we'll come back with interactive data on the web as 